now going to introduce our past president of the British Psychological Society, Jamie Hacker Hughes, who's sitting here in front of me. Uh, Jamie is a clinical psychologist whose career uh, has been mainly in the field of military and veteran mental health. He was head of clinical psychology at the Ministry of Defence and then established the Veterans and Families Institute at Anglia Ruskin University, where he's visiting professor. He also holds visiting and honorary professorships at three other universities, and he is currently in his last few weeks as society vice president. So, three Peter, can you get rid of your advert? <laughs> <laughs> can you put Mike's picture up? That'd be nice. <laughs> the job of the uh, BPS Society Vice President is to keep the president in check. <laughs> <laughs> Everything else is extra. Um, it's a real honour, Mike, to be here this afternoon. Um, really very grateful to have been asked. Jamie, do you want to take one of the wandering mics? If you I can take a wandering mic, yes, let me do that. It's just uh, that it's being recorded. It's shall I what, a sort of walk around the one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And can you make sure it's switched on? I will make sure it's switched on. Usually there's a little button at the... Um... Right. Yeah. Okay, well this, this works. Okay. Um, I first came across... Mike's name through the pages of um, Clinical Psychology Forum. Clinical Psychology Forum is required reading for all clinical psychology trainees, of course, um, but also uh, for all, all members of, of the Division of Clinical Psychology. Um, and Mike's name would appear often. Um, and then I gradually observed the, the rising through the ranks as chair elect and then chair of the Division of Clinical Psychology. And I didn't meet Mike, I think, until either um, shortly after he'd been chair um, at one of the Division of Clinical Psychology's winter. It was a winter conference in London. I remember it because it was a winter conference because, with these, you know, you get these sort of freebie bags where you carry all your stuff. It had a whacking great snowflake on it. And a wonderful red lining as well. Very, very natty uh, indeed. And that's, that's where, where I first met Mike. Um, we have a few things in common. Um, we're both clinical psychologists. Um, I'm not nearly as eminent academically as, as he, but, um, but we're both clinical psychologists. We're both clinical neuropsychologists. Um, and we're both uh, Christians. Um, and as previously been mentioned by, uh, by, uh, by Peter, um, uh, I think it was Peter, or Noel, one of the two, or both. Uh, Mike was one of the um, founder members of the Bakit British Association for uh, um, Christians in Psychology, the John Hall. So it's really very, very good to be here today. Um, it was particularly nice. I don't know where you are hiding, Colin. I'm looking for a sort of maroon, strawberry coloured sweatshirt. There you are, right in the back. Particularly nice to be reunited with. Colin Newman. Um, Colin came along and said, hello, Jamie, I'm part of the walking history of clinical psychology, which indeed he is. Um, and I said, well, I bet you don't remember teaching me perception back at university in 1977, um, which he didn't, actually. Um, but he did. Um, I, um, I was going to be a dentist, actually. I was going to be a maxillofacial surgeon, um, and maxillofacial surgeons put people's faces together that have been really badly smashed up. Um, I didn't really work for my A-levels, so I got some rubbish grades, and I got one offer, which I just failed to get. But I breezed into dental school because the offers were lower. You see, you've got to do both. To be a maxillofacial surgeon, you've got to do dentistry and medicine, fellowship in, in medical surgery, fellowship in dental surgery, you're about 50 by the time you get going, really. But um, anyway, I was rubbish at dentistry. That's the short, the short answer. I was completely rubbish. I was good at the psychological bits. I was good at um, giving nervous kids a ride up and down on the chair and squirting them in the water and the <laughs> air and then tickling them with a little brush and then putting the banana paste on and so, saying, OK, I'm going to do a little bit more tickling. But what they didn't tell them was there was a drill on the end. But, yeah. so, so, so I was good at I knew nothing about systematic de desensitization then. Um, however, when it came to doing fillings and dentures, I was rubbish. And 
Um, this was back in 19, 1977. So let's just cast our, 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 our story stops there. So we'll go back to 1967. 1967, so 50 years ago now, um, clinical psychology had just become a division of the British Psychological Society. We celebrated the anniversary in Westminster at a very posh do with Lisa Cameron MP, the society's first ever clinical psychologist MP. We had a cake, we had a marquee, we had MPs, we had Peter, you know, we had the lot. Um, uh, we had, were you there, Mike? Yes, that did us for that, but <laughs> phew. <laughs> um, but yes, so the division of clinical, we all think that clinical psychology is old as the hills. Um, the BPS was founded twice in 1901 and then 1906. The reason it was refounded was that the Psychological Society, there were two of them, and one of them were up to very dodgy stuff. So they refounded it in 1906. No different from today. <laughs> no different from today. <laughs> Uh, so it was refounded in 1906. <clears throat> but clinical psychology was nowhere on the map in those early days. Academic psychology, yes. Industrial psychology, as it, was, as it was called, yes. Educational psychology, yes. Clinical psychology, not until much later. And it was really, you'll know, sort of after World War II, really through the works of people like Monty Shapiro, the clinical psychology, and, uh, uh, and, and Isaac, and, and others, mainly at the Maudsley, which is another place too, um, up in, um, up in Glasgow and, uh, and elsewhere, came on the map. So 50 years ago, the Division of Clinical Psychology was founded within the BPS. We were a baby. So you know, those of you in the audience who are trainee clinical psychologists, who think that it's been around for ages, but it has, of course, but for old people like me and younger people like Mike, then actually it hasn't been around that long after all. So, so that was then, so 1967. 19, 19, 19, 1977, which is when Colin was teaching me perception, very briefly, before Hereford and Worcester LEA said, you've had two years grant, you think you want another three, get lost. Um, um, a very significant thing for psychology and clinical psychology happened in 1977. One of our most eminent woman clinical psychologist, May Davidson, OBE, um, was very involved in something called the Trethowan Report, 1977. Now, the this was actually what got me into um, the doing psychology, because the Trethowan Report said clinical psychology, which up until then had been subservient to medicine, could finally be an independent profession and take referrals directly from GPs. This is what got me into clinical psychology. I couldn't carry on with my dentistry. I wandered around the university, lonely as a cloud. I wandered into the, 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 the psychology department, and I might be imagining this. It might be some sort of fantasy. It probably was. On the notice board was a picture of a young woman in a white coat with a clipboard saying, do you want to be a clinical psychologist? I thought, well, forget about maxillofacial surgery. Yes, I do. If I can have a white <laughs> coat and a clipboard, yes, I do. Now, I've only met two clinical psychologists ever in a white coat. One was in the Czech Republic and one was in Saudi Arabia. But there you go. So um, this just found the report was really, really <coughs> instrumental in the development of, of our profession. And our profession was developing I know this is meant to be about the future of, of clinical psychology, but it's often useful to look back, isn't it? So, so um, 30 years ago, 1987, where were we? Well, 1987, I had chucked in my career as a um, very successful computer sales manager, taken a 90% pay cut, and went to work at the Maudsley as a nursing assistant, en route to becoming a person in a white coat with a clipboard, um, because that's what I wanted to be. 1987, Psychology, clinical psychology was really, really establishing itself. It was very, very clear. It was organized by regional health authorities, district health authorities. There were district psychologists. All the psychologists were clustered into departments under a district head, autonomous, lots of power, minimum paperwork, um, and a real sense of collegiality. That's, that's, that's where we were. And then things sort of started sort of slowly, slowly happening. So um, the old, big, the red brick 
um, asylums, out-of-town asylums with the water cooler and the clocks. They were gradually turned into luxury housing, and quite rightly, people were moved out into the community, and psychologists moved out into community mental health teams, working alongside psychiatrists and social workers, in some cases, and community mental health nurses, and OTs. Um, and usually the psychiatrists ran the show. So although we were an autonomous profession, yes, we could take referrals directly from GPs, um, it was, I mean, some of my best friends really are psychiatrists, actually. Um, Simon Wesley, who's outgoing president of the Royal College of Psychiatrists, literally lives down the road from me. Uh, when I was a nursing assistant at the Maudsley, he was a junior registrar, and, uh, and we've sort of got on ever, ever since. And um, his wife, Claire, who was chair of the Royal College of General Practitioners as well. Um, but, you know, so, so, so things, were, things were changing. The district departments were changing. The district head role was going. And, and, and gradually it became more and more different. It, this is just my own personal experience for heads of psychology departments to keep an eye on all their sort of disparate psychologists who have been increasingly scattered around the place. So when I first qualified, my first job was an old, in an old um, Victorian county asylum. I had my interview in the boardroom with wood panelling and, and, uh, and uh, oil paintings. Um, and then was taken to see the psychology department, which was in the brewery. Uh, the brewery, you may say, yes, the brewery. Why the brewery? Because, uh, actually, if you give uh, people who are living in, uh, in these places uh, a few pints of beer, makes them happy, easier to manage. If you give the staff a few pints of beer, makes them happy, easier to manage. Anyway, so it was in the brewery. The brewery closed down when some patients fell into the beer, which wasn't very good. So apparently that's how, how it ended. Um, by the time we'd moved in, it really was falling down. It was, it was, it was occupied by pigeons. Um, but um, all the psychologists were pretty much all in one place. And then gradually, uh, I think I was in the second community mental health team to be, be set up. So, so things were changing. And then if we go back, say, say 20 years now, um, so this is 97, things had changed a lot. Uh, regions had gone. Districts had gone, we moved over to the new model, we moved over to the purchaser-provider split, so where trusts were bidding for contracts. And you know what happens when people start bidding for contracts, it all gets financial, and people are looking for savings, and job gets cut. jobs get cut. And this was actually happening. Um, and especially sort of high-tier bands. So, so there used to be... Uh, in, under the old banding system, you could be a top-grade psychologist with greater responsibility. What a job title was that? Top-grade psychologist with greater responsibility, um, which got translated into a band nine. Band nine jobs started disappearing. Band eight D jobs started disappearing. There was a sort of heyday around then where there were lots of clinical psychologists who were on trust boards as... Um, as directors of psychology and psychotherapy services. There are a few of those still around, um, but they are a, a diminishing, um, a, a diminishing um, species. So, um, and then um, we, so we moved from so, so 1990, 1997 through to 10 years ago, um, 2007, um, and where are we? Well. The Division of Clinical Psychology is the largest division in the British Psycholo Psychological Society. The BPS has got about uh, 60,000 members, just under. The Division of Clinical Psychology has got over 10,000. We are by far the largest, most powerful division in, in, the, clinical, in, in, the, um, in the BPS, um, followed by the occupational psychologists, the educational psychologists, and then you probably don't know, or you might not know, but there are seven other divisions. Clinical, counselling, educational, Scottish educational, forensic, health, neuro, occupational, um, sports and exercise, and academic research and teaching. So, very, very powerful um, division. Um, but are we, as a profession, are we as powerful as we might be? Well, 
I had some ideas about this. I, they, I, I won't repeat, Mike said, please don't repeat that speech that you gave at the, at the conference. I gave a speech about, you know, about the future of psychology, and I told the story, which I'll tell very quickly, about how on Radio 4 in the mornings, I always heard non-psychologists talking about psychology. And I got cross, and I threw things at the radio, and turned it off, and all sorts of stuff. And that's why I came up with this idea, which seemed a good idea at the time, to have a campaign for a Royal College of Psychologists. So I thought, this is what we need, Royal College of Psychologists, take on the other people on their own turf, on their own game, sap air wolf hypothesis, what you call something determines what you think about something, Royal College of Psychologists. We attracted about a thousand supporters. Um, I, when I was talking to Colin earlier on, I reminded him that when we were coming up to the centenary of the BPS, I suggested a very similar thing. They said, well, how should we mark the centenary of the BPS? I said, well, become a Royal Psychological Society. Why not? And a lot of people thought that was a very good idea. And a lot of people, for various reasons, didn't think it was a very good idea. So, so it never happened. So, but it's all about um, how do we, as psychologists, become more influential, um, I don't want to use the word power, really. It's influence, I think, is, is, is probably much, much more important. And so, so looking towards the future, what can we do? Peter has talked about the idea of having a common syllabus and then specialising. Um, it's, what, it's what medics do in their training. It's what lots of people do in their training. They do a common syllabus and, and then train. Peter's also talked about... Um, about uh, different sorts of psychologists working together. Um, occupational psychologists, clinical psychologists, counseling psychologists, health psychologists, forensic psychologists working together. Yes, absolutely possible. And in fact, just literally the other day, I had an email from a clinical psychology, psych psychology colleague down in the Southwest who was saying, actually, this is what we're doing down there. We are having centers of, uh, of psychology down in the Southwest where numerous different sorts of psychologists are working together and doing so, so really, really efficiently. As um, BPS president-elect and then president and then vice president, I was handed um, a very, very nice present, really. Um, I, kept, I wasn't involved in BPS politics or committees or anything at all until we got to the Radio 4 you know, um, throwing incident. Um, and the psychologist opened in December had a similar thing you know, nominations required for president um, 2015 2016 and I thought I could do that um, I've got skills to do it I'm going to have a go and what I wanted to do was actually to try and make the BPS not make, facilitate, help the BPS to become more efficient um, more influential uh, and so Peter and I and Doc Meal, our predecessor, and others have worked really hard to actually um, influence the policy agenda, the work, work capability assessment, uh, the refugee agenda, setting up the, the presidential task force, um, all sorts of matters, you know, speaking out where we thought. But, but the real present was being allowed to restructure the BPS. And so for the last three years, um, I've chaired um, a group of really good, hard-working psychologists and hard-working BPS staff. And the first changes are hopefully going to go to trustees very, very shortly to be agreed. The first changes are actually, the, in a way, the easier ones, the governance bringing in, as, as Peter talked about, lay people onto the board of trustees. Um, I hate the word service user. I, I prefer the word person, so people, onto the... Um, onto the board of trustees, rejigging the boards so that they, they work much more effectively, including an outward facing board, establishing a democratic uh, senate which makes, um, which makes decisions and sets priorities. The exciting bit for me is that under the new structure, um, we are proposing something called a college of psychologists. So where all psychologists, applied psychologists, come together um, and actually can work actively to lobby, to advocate, to educate, uh, to influence. Um, and I see this working really well, actually, especially within, because if you just think about, say, healthcare psychologists, so 
um, I changed the, the, the name of the, um, the organization that I used to run in the, in the MAD from Defense Clinical Psychology to Defense Healthcare Psychology because we had counseling psychologists, health psychologists, forensic psychologists, neuropsychologists working together. But if you just think of those, those professions, clinical psychology, counseling psychology, health psychology, neuropsychology, um, forensic psychology, all working together instead of at each other's throats, which has gone on for far, far, far too long. Um, actually, if you think about the membership of the BPS, that block would straight easily become the largest block within the BPS um, and would be able to, to really do things on a scale that hasn't been done before. We, um, I, I really have got nothing against psychiatrists. I work very well with psychiatrists. They refer to me, I refer to them. We get on very well socially. What I envy them, and as a good Franciscan Christian, I shouldn't envy anybody, but I, I must admit to it, so I'll confess to you that I do, is their sort of media and policy machine, which is fantastic. They get things into the paper, their president is all over the place, and they're a quarter of the size we are, a quarter of the size the BPS is. Now, if we had a block of, say, 40,000, 30, 40,000 healthcare psychologists acting as a block, within the BPS, with the whole support of the BPS, the BPS structure. I forgot to mention in my potted history, of course, that we missed out on regulation. So we were, we were hoping that the government would allow the BPS to register psychologists, but it didn't go that way. And we had to be um, uh, registered along with um, hearing aid technicians and all sorts of other people by the HCPC. Again, I don't actually know any hearing aid technicians yet. I think that the time is fast coming, <laughs> I'm sure. Um, so that, so, so yeah, that, that didn't happen. That could have given us a, 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 a very, very useful place to have a regulatory framework for psychologists controlled by psychologists. But so, so crystal ball, where will, where will we, we be in, um, in 2027? Um, I think that we will um, have an even larger British Psychological Society. I think that we will have a strong body of clinical psychologists. We have really got to win the fight, and it is a fight at the moment about funding. Funding is really, really threatened at the moment. We've been in a really privileged position as clinical psychologists to have all our postgraduate training and funding paid for. That is no longer guaranteed, and so Peter and others are working really, really hard and talking talking to people to try and guarantee that, so, so let's uh, hope we do that. But I would like to see that the College of Psychologists, healthcare psychologists in particular, working in concert, um, not for us, not for our profession, although of course we do, but for <coughs> the people who we've got the honor and the privilege of serving and working with, which is why we all came into this in the first place. Thanks so much. <laughs>